Good afternoon, everyone. Just a quick introduction to our uh, veteran guru, overall finance guy, Wes Gray. Thanks, Chris, and I uh, appreciate you inviting me here to Google. I have, actually have a huge respect for the firm. We use it both personally and for our business. And uh, I'm the founder of Alpha Architect, and our business is focused on empowering investors through education. And part of our effort is we do a ton of research, including writing books. And one book we've written with a couple of my colleagues, Jack Bogle and David Folk, is the Do-It-Yourself Financial Advisor. And the thesis of this book is that financial advice, as it currently stands, is too complex and too opaque, but you can make it simple and transparent. And a potential thing we should consider is if financial advice can be simple and transparent and still be effective, maybe we don't need intermediaries and all these expensive advisors. And so that's the argument here is that do-it-yourself is not for everyone, but it's not impossible. So what is the problem with advice that's too complex and too opaque? Well, you make the Wolf of Wall Street really rich. Why is advice complex? Because complexity sells. Right? If I'm a broker or an advisor and I say, go buy and hold Vanguard funds forever, you're going to say, well, why the heck do I need you to be my advisor? Why am I paying all this money? Right? So advice has to be complex, even though it may not work, because it sells. Right? So this is, this is what we face out there. What is the problem with that? Let me orient it to this slide. So on the x-axis, you have Goldman Sachs, which epitomizes the smartest people in the room. If anyone can beat the market, Goldman Sachs should be able to beat the market, right? And over here on the right, you have Vanguard, which is the exact opposite of Goldman Sachs. They don't even try to beat the market. They say, we're going to deliver you the market exposure at the lowest cost possible. On the y-axis right here, we have the percentage of funds by these respective entities, the smartest people in the room in Vanguard. And these are the percentage of funds that over the last 10 years, from 04 to 2014, that beat their respective benchmark indices. Goldman sits, unfortunately, at around 10%. So one out of 10 funds provided by Goldman Sachs, which is just an example of the smartest people in the room, doesn't beat the passive benchmark. Whereas Vanguard over here has a hit rate of around 45 to 50 percent, which makes sense. If I'm not trying to beat the benchmark, I'm going to have some that win, some that lose, but on average, I'm going to be average. Great. What do you notice between these two folks? Key difference is the average fee charged. 120 basis points, or 1.2% for the average Goldman fund. 17 basis points for the average Vanguard fund. So one-sixth the cost with way better performance. And as Jack Bogle says here, you know, who's the smart money now? So just because you are really smart and you're an expert and you have all the expertise, that doesn't mean that your clients end up winning. You may win but the clients may not win. So we need to consider this, and this is the problem with too much complexity and not enough transparency, is the wolf gets rich, we don't as the clients, right? So what is the solution? Well, the reality, just from an evidence-based perspective, is that financial advice can be incredibly simple and transparent. And the simplest thing that we could do is what we call the 60-40 portfolio. 60% in a global stock index, 40% in a global bond index. You could probably manage this in your underwear from your dorm room for 15 to 20 basis points, right? Totally easy and actually really effective. If you look historically, this portfolio works. So if anyone's gonna add layers of complexity, they need to be benchmarked against the cheapest, most liquid, and simple portfolio that one can imagine. And I'm only going to believe your, your extra complexity if you can show me via evidence that it actually is superior. 
One of the biggest challenges to DIY is the expert. Don't listen to experts and be very skeptical of what they have to say for the following reasons. One, experts know that humans suffer from behavioral bias. So at another point in my life, almost 10 years ago, I actually get to hang out with the uh, Iraqi army. And we have two types of people. We have the rational people, which I happen to be part of this club this time. Usually I'm not. We have irrational people. What do rational people do? Well, we wear our Kevlars. Why? Because if this hut back here gets smashed with a mortar and a piece of cement goes blazing towards your head, you want to have something protecting you. So you wear Kevlar, right? We also bring extra ammunition. Why does that make sense? Well, if you get shot at, it'd be nice to shoot back, right? So we got to bring extra ammunition. We also need to bring a source of water which I don't know if you can see on these two rational folks here. Because in 125 degree weather, if you're not drinking and hydrating, you're going to probably die of heat stroke before you die of an IED or something, right? So rational people in this environment do this sort of stuff. Then we got exhibit B. No Kevlar, because wearing a Kevlar, it's heavy, it's hot. Why would I want to wear it? I'm going to hold it. Ammunition, we don't need ammunition. It's heavy, it's hot, I don't want to carry it. Leave that back at the barracks, right? And of course, don't bring a source of water because, you know, in Arab culture over there, especially within like the military ranks, it's kind of weak to drink water. So we're not going to do that, right? What's the point? The point is when we're in distressed, emotional situations, we sometimes do irrational things. And that's not to say that in a financial market, it's like being in a combat zone. But in many respects, it is. Because it's emotionally charged. People on CNBC are saying the world's going to blow up. And this is going to inspire bad decision making. So remember this. We're influenced by bias. Even smart people that work at Google suffer from bias. The other thing we got to recognize is that Humans love stories at the expense of evidence, right? So we've got the fancy schmancy hedge fund manager who's got his yacht and his house in Martha's Vineyard. He's like, hey, just all you got to do is do what I do, and you can have this too. It's a great story. Good enough for him, good enough for me. Even though the evidence says time and time again, when we buy expensive, overpriced products, we allow the hedge fund manager to afford the yacht and the Martha's Vineyard location, but we don't get to afford that location because we're paying him all the fees, right? It's a great story. People have studied the human belief in stories at the expense of evidence in great detail. Back, B.F. Skinner almost 60, 70 years ago said, why do human beings believe in crazy stories, even though there's so much evidence to suggest that their beliefs are insane. Why do they have these superstitions? So they look at the pigeon, because a pigeon's about as basic an animal as you can get, right? So what they do with these pigeons, they say, okay, pigeons, we're gonna make you hungry. And then we're gonna put you in a cage. And every five seconds, a piece of bird seed's gonna pop out, right? And what do pigeons do? Well, pigeons are kind of random, so they'll bebop around their cage, and one will kick left, a piece of bird seed will pop out. They're like, oh, all right, nice. Eat my bird seed, right? Bebopping around just by randomness, they may kick again to the left. Bird seed popped out. Pigeons start thinking, if I kick to the left, <laughs> bird seed comes out, right? And they start developing this story, and they get this superstition. And then, then the researchers say, okay, now that we've established this story and this superstition, which is just based on noise, can we untrain this pigeon to stop believing that if we give it enough evidence? So start tweaking it around where it actually systematically, when it kicks left, it doesn't get food. And what they find is that once an animal, even a pigeon, and this applies to humans, gets stuck in a story, trying to give them a lot of evidence to convince them they're wrong is actually incredibly difficult because stories sell. Why is this important? 
Well, consumer beware. Experts are very well trained at exploiting your bias and very well trained at telling you great stories. And the irony here is, in many respects, I should be considered an expert, right? I don't know why, but I was on the cover of Barron's last week. I got a PhD in finance. I've written four books, do all this research. So I'm the expert telling you to not listen to the expert, which is actually the best advice you could possibly get from this discussion here. So everything I say, make sure it goes in one ear and out the other, right? So with that disclaimer up front, Let's analyze how can we potentially add evidence-based solutions that can improve this so-called 60-40 portfolio. And there's a lot of metrics we can look at to try to improve this thing, but we're going to focus on two here just because uh, of time constraints. And one is asset allocation. So trying to determine how much stocks do we own, how much bond, how much commodity, how much whatever. And the other one is stock selection. Do we just go buy a Vanguard fund, or do we try to become Warren Buffett and pick value stocks or whatever, right? So we're going to walk through both of these in, in detail and kind of discuss how and why we may want to add complexity, or maybe we don't want to add complexity. So first, asset allocation. So before I tell you what's going on here, this paper is a 2009 paper in the Review of Financial Studies, which if you don't read geeky finance research, you probably don't know what it is. But it's a top tier A publication that all the finance professors have to be aware of. And what this paper shows, or what these authors attempt to do, is they say, listen, people have won Nobel Prizes for these ideas of mean variance analysis and modern portfolio theory, which are rampant throughout society. You know, I teach in all my classes. Everyone has to teach modern portfolio theory. But they ask a simple question. Does this crap actually work in a practical sense? And they say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to look at the 1 over n rule, equal weighting a portfolio. So if we have 10 assets, i.e. n equals 10, let's just put 10% in each asset and use that as our asset allocation scheme. Right? And we're going to compare that against all the whiz-bang fancy models that have been published in academic research with tons of math and nice closed form solutions, all these good things. And I'm just showing show an example right here, and I'll just read what the, the authors say. Of the 14 models we evaluate, none is consistently better than 1 over n rule. That is remarkable. All that brain damage and power that went into solving this stuff that wins Nobel Prizes gets published, but has absolutely limited practical benefit. That's remarkable. They're basically saying this stuff doesn't work. Here's some of the evidence just to give you one example. They do this across multiple asset classes. You know, it's an academic journal, so they got to do robustness tests until they, they're blue in the face. But essentially, on the x-axis here, you have the sharp ratio which if you're not familiar with that, it's just a, a risk-adjusted benefit. Higher is better. And they compare, I just call them fancy models, against 1 over N when they're looking to allocate across S&P sectors, right? So you have like utilities, financials, whatever, energy. We could use a fancy optimization model to try to pick and choose the weights, or we could just do 1 over N. And remarkably, 1 over N, which is insanely easy and robust, has the highest sharp ratio. So not only is it, does it equal their performance, it actually beats most of these things. What's the bottom line? When it comes to asset allocation, complexity does not work. It's just the evidence. So if someone tries to sell you something that sounds really cool, and it probably is really cool, remember the evidence doesn't back or support that it probably works out of sample. So what could be the implication of that? And this is just an example, and these are all frameworks. I'm not saying you should do this or you shouldn't. But we have our baseline 60-40 up here. And we know that doing things that are crazy complex don't really add much value. But maybe we can add one degree of complexity to build a little bit more robust portfolio. 
So one idea out there is presented by Meb Faber and Eric Richardson, a great book called The Ivy Portfolio. I think Meb's actually spoke here before. And what he shows is something really compelling. You can capture 90 to 95% of the returns of endowments and, and very sophisticated people by simply allocating in an equal weight fashion to five asset classes. Domestic equity, international equity, real estate, commodities, and bonds, which you could buy some ETFs for next to nothing and capture the world's risk premiums simply. What I do here is just map that concept into the 60-40 and, and tell you why this might make a little bit more sense at the margin than a generic 60-40. You still have your 60 over here, divvy it up domestic, international. Why does that make rough sense? Well, that, that about approximates the market capitalization of US securities and international securities. You're kind of passively capturing those risks. And instead of doing 40% all in on a fixed income instrument, what happens if we turn into Zimbabwe? I'm not saying that would happen, but there's a risk that we could have a hyperinflation uh, element. Maybe for our diversifier bucket here in that 40%, we just break it in half. 20% real, 20% fixed. So instead of 40% fixed income, you know, maybe some real estate commodities kind of capturing real hyperinflation hedges and then stick with that fixed income. So a small tweak that might make this portfolio's overall architecture a little bit more robust than 60-40. Not to say that 60-40 is bad, but this may be one tweak you could use to enhance it if you chose to, right? So real simple, I'm not even showing results here, but this is also effective. All these things are actually effective even though they're insanely easy. And they're also really effective because they're really cheap, too. Okay, so that's asset allocation. Next is stock selection. And there's huge debates about this because the evidence is very clear that over time, if you look at the sample of mutual funds, they basically deliver the S&P minus a bunch of fees. That's not a good idea, right? So that's why Jack Bogle says, well, let's just buy the Vanguard fund for five bips and you're gonna be better off. Why in the heck would anyone want to try to be Warren Buffett? And that's a really good question, because as you'll find out here, it's really hard to be Warren Buffett. And we also know that for every active winner, there's got to be an active loser, right? So when you get down the active game, it's not like there's just free money. Just because you're smarter than everyone, you're going to win. You're always systematically having to take from someone else, because in the end, it basically is a zero-sum game for all intents and purposes. I happen to be a believer in active stock selection, and I'll tell you my story of why. So I used to hang out with this guy. His name's Eugene Fama. He's now a famous Nobel Prize winner, right? So I'm doing my dissertation, the University of Chicago. I came back from the Marines, and I was you know, feeling happy about myself. I was like, what could I do that would be so ridiculous at this school that it just would be interesting? I'm going to try to show Eugene Fama, the guy who basically won the Nobel Prize for the Fisher Mark hypothesis, that this value investing stuff works. Because right? I've been reading Warren Buffett, reading Ben Graham my whole life. I think this is compelling. I'm going to figure out how to study this uh, in, a, in a nice, robust way. So I go read 4,000 reports submitted to this organization called valueinvestorsclub.com which is starred by a guy named Joe Greenblatt, who's a famous hedge fund manager, famous value investor. And I tabulate all these results up, and I write in my one chapter of my dissertation, value investors have stock picking skills. Send it to our friend here, who's probably the hardest working man in finance. And of course, he immediately responds in email, your conclusion has to be false. I'm like, oh, crap, that, that's, that was just wasted a year of my life. So I run down to Professor Fama's office. I'm like, I was like, we, what, do we, what do we mean it's false? I, like, what, did I screw up in my statistics or the study? And he's like, Wes, Wes, calm down. He's like, your analysis is fine, but you can't say that 
value investors have stock picking skills. You have to say the sample of value investors you analyze have stock picking skills. I was like, all right, so I just got to change some words? He's like, yeah, words matter. I was like, roger that, I'm out of this place. Sign the diploma. I'm out of the, this pain train that you call the Chicago Finance PhD program. And I walk out of that place thinking, OK, markets are not perfectly efficient, because there is evidence that some people have this ability. And it seems to be compelling. More studies that come out. So this is a study from Cliff Aziz and some of his friends. Very compelling paper published in the Journal of Finance. Value and momentum everywhere. And they highlight that value, which is classified as just buying cheap stuff everyone hates, and value, or sorry, momentum, which is buying securities that have strong relative performance, are everywhere. They're in every asset class you could imagine. It's super compelling, and I've written books dedicated to each of this. So quantitative value is a whole book dedicated to systematic value investing. We just sent a manuscript, another one, on momentum. This stuff is baked in the cake. It, it has worked. So the natural question is value and momentum are open secrets. They've been working for over 100 years. Why isn't everyone doing this? And this gets the understanding of how and why active investments actually work and are sustainable. And you have to have a whole framework for this it's called the Sustainable Active Investing Framework. And the best way to think about it is like playing at a, at a poker game when you're in the stock markets. We need to know at the table who is the worst poker player at the table, right? Because we're going to need to take from someone else because it's a zero-sum game. But simultaneously, you can't just know who the worst poker player is at a poker table because if there's someone way smarter than you, you're also the fish, right? So we need to know who are the best poker players at the stock market investing table and what are their capabilities and limitations. Only one we can identify the bad poker player, which is usually represented by investors that suffer from some sort of systematic behavioral bias that actually can influence stock prices. And then simultaneously, we understand the capabilities and limitations of these good poker players, i.e. the people with billions of dollars of resources and access to all the information in the world. Only then can we identify sustainable active opportunities. And the bottom line is real active investing that works can't be easy, because it'll get arbitraged out immediately. Value investing is a classic example of how we can take all that mumbo jumbo theory and put, put a little meat on the bones here. So what is value investing? What is the so-called value anomaly? Just, so if, just to give you a reference. So this is some results from a paper we published a while ago. Essentially, value investing and the value anomaly is this idea that if you just buy cheap stocks, like you sort 1,000 securities on PE ratio, and you just systematic every year buy the cheapest ones, and you create portfolios where you also buy the most expensive ones, represented here by Glamour, top 20% most expensive, top 20% cheapest. Over time, no matter how you figure out how we're going to measure value, you get this spread of anywhere from you know, 4 to 7% in this sample. That's each year. If you compound 4 to 7% for 40 years, it's the difference between being Warren Buffett and being me. Right? You're going to be rich if you did this. So this is the anomaly. You just buy cheap stuff. So what is going on here? So back in the literature, value investing in this anomaly can be explained by one of two things, extra risk or maybe it's mispricing. How are we going to study this? Well, Lakanshak, Cypher, and Vishni in a Journal of Finance 1994 paper do exactly this. So this was over 20 years ago. They say, how are we going to determine whether this is because of extra risk or due to mispricing? So what they do is they source securities on book to market in this case, expensive to cheap. On our y-axis here is the past five years earnings growth rates. And what you notice is a monotonic relationship between price 
and past fundamentals. What is the implied market expectation embedded in these prices? Well, these securities are expensive because it is necessarily implied that that will continue. Why else would you pay a lot of money for a stock, right? Why would you want to buy Facebook at whatever PE it is right now unless you thought Facebook was going to continue to have this amazing growth, right? So it's extrapolated out into the future. That's why these are expensive. Similarly, down here in the trash can, amongst the cheapest securities that no one really likes, these are the dead dinosaur companies or, or whatever it might be, they're dead and dinosaured out and cheap because they've done poorly recently. And the implied market expectation is they're probably going to do poorly in the future. right? That's why they're cheap. If everyone thought they were going to do well in the future, they would be over here. They're not. So, so we know the expectation that's baked in the cake. This is going to continue, and this is going to continue. Well, what actually happens in the future? Systematic mean reversion in results. The gross stocks never achieve, on average, what the market thought they were going to achieve, what was baked in the cake. Similarly, cheap trash stocks were expected to basically all go bankrupt. And on average, they never go all bankrupt. The world gets a little bit better, enters mean reversion. So why does value work? And why does growth or expensive not work? Because the price valuation is essentially proxying for a bad market expectation. So when you own the cheap stocks, and it turns out it's not as bad as thought, you essentially front run a market expectation. When an expectation changes, you make money and beat the market. Similarly, these gross securities here, they're expected to do Groupon example. Go forever, oh, you're only making 20% you know, returns on your revenue, not 50, chop you in half. That expectation change, you underperform the market. So this is baked in the cake. Mispricing explains some component of the value anomaly, right? Clearly there might be some risk as well, but you can't deny that mispricing is in there. So why in the heck don't we all just go buy a bunch of cheap stocks Here's why. It is painful. And the best poker players in the room don't like pain. So from 94 to 99, this is just a performance of a generic value strategy versus the broad index when the internet's going crazy. Six years of getting your face ripped off. Do you think anyone managing money, either in a delegated sense or on their own, could stick to a program where even on the cover of Barron's, they say Warren Buffett has lost his magic touch, right? Value investing in particular and strategies that actually have staying power have to be painful. Why is that? Well, a lot of this has to do with the agency conflict and the problem with delegated asset management, right? Because if you, if you give money to an asset manager, you gave them two options. So you're giving this money to this expert. Option one, you tell the asset manager, I'm going to deliver you a strategy that's going to beat the market by 25 basis points a year for the next 10 years. And every year, you have a little edge. They're like, oh, that sounds amazing, right? Or you give them option two. I got a strategy or system that can beat the market by 5% a year over the next 10 years, but I guarantee there's going to be a three-year period where you lose to this thing by 10% each year. A delegated asset manager who knows his clients can be crazy and focus on short-term performance may punt on this long-duration arbitrage because there's too much career risk. And these career risk-minded folks tend to be the best poker players in the room because good poker players get allocated a ton of capital. But we know they have this agency conflict, so certain strategies go right to the heart of that conflict, where they know they work, but they're not going to do them because they want to clip a coupon on basically a closet indexing strategy. right? So good strategies that are sustainable have to be painful, or everyone would do it, and the smart poker players would already arbitrage it out.
So when we map value, and you can do this with any strategy if it's active, into the sustainable active framework, Worst poker players are basically those that overreact to bad fundamentals, this company's dead, blah, 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 that we know on average fundamentals never are as bad as people think in extremes. And people aren't going to do this stuff, especially in concentrated, heavy, career risk laden format, because you'll get fired. And people like to keep their jobs. So this is a place where presumably we know the edge, and we know why others aren't doing it, but we need to have the capital and the discipline to actually stick with this opportunity because it's systematically got to be hard, right? So active investing is something that can work, but clearly it's not for everyone, and you really got to think hard about how and why it can work out of sample. So I hope everyone's ready to DIY because you got your asset allocation, and you know, stick simple, Keep robust, diversified, low cost on stock selection. Best solution for probably 90, 95% of people, stick with the Vanguard fund because you're probably not wired to be weird and crazy. Um, if you do want to do active, know the sustainable active framework. Be wired to you know, not be cool at a cocktail party sometime. Um, and that's all you got to do. But let's take a test now which will identify whether you actually have the capability to be a DIY investor or not. This involves a little bit of interaction, which is good, so we can wake you guys up. So I'm going to ask you guys to all stand up right now. So everyone get out of their seat, and I'm going to tell you what the situation here. So this is a time back in 2008 during a financial market crisis. I'm not going to tell you when, but you all know that the market blew up. And if you think, th this is going to be monthly, time series, monthly time series popping out of here. So if you think that the next return is going to be positive, raise your hand. If you think it's going to be a bearish market, keep your hands by your side. So think about your history. We're 2008 here. You know, think about it. You, know, you can Google it probably. Cheat. What do you guys think? So everyone, everyone's bearish here. All right, so you're a bull, you got to sit down. So it was actually bearish. It was actually bearish. Okay, next period. Think hard about this. I'm just telling you it's in 2008. You don't know when. So if you think it's going to be bullish, keep your hand up. If you think it's bearish, keep it down. A lot of bears in the room. Bears got it. All right, next one. I told you momentum works, and we're seeing it here, right? Um, just in the opposite way. Bullish or bearish? Raise your hand if you're bullish. If you're bearish, keep it by your side. Not a lot of bulls around here. All right, all the bears, you got to sit down. If you're bullish, you got to stand up. We're starting to identify the real stock pickers in the room here. All right, next one. This is pretty good. Google's got a, a smart crowd. You, this is a lot higher percentage than normally. Bullish or bearish? All right, a lot of bulls. Sit down. So who's our, who's our geniuses in the room here? All right, guys, you ready? <laughs> what did I just do to you? I just manipulated everyone in the room with framing, anchoring, availability, and hopefully you, you got to experience that the human mind is so good at trying to interpret total noise as actual signal, right? And, and, and hopefully you just experienced this where you really felt like, oh, yeah, 08, that looks kind of like in like September or what have you. And that's why you got to ask yourself, before your DIY, you might need a psychology coach. Because unless you're wired to follow a process and hang on to it like grim death, there is a benefit to having an advisory component or someone that helps you as a psychology benefit, which seems crazy that you'd pay money for someone to like keep you in line, but that would make that could be a huge value proposition, right? In 2008, if your advisor tells you don't jump off the cliff, even if they charge a ton of money, there's a huge benefit to that. So really when it comes down to determining should I do this myself and save all these fees and not deal with all these idiotic expert people that are just trying to sell me on stuff, you got to remember am I wired to actually be able to do this. And if you're not, 
unfortunately, you probably should go essentially hire a psychology coach, right? If you get real rich and famous, maybe you got to burn some money on, you know, state and tax lawyers. But that's really your decision point, and hopefully this made that clear. So, in the end, our mission is to empower investor education. We facilitate this. We offer free tools. You want to do some back testing. You want to do your own trading. Go buck wild. Um, we kind of have a Google mission on our blog where Google's mission is to essentially capture all the world's data and make it organized and understandable for people. We do that in the finance context where we read source journals, you know, decipher all the mathematics and try to say what is the bottom line here. So we're trying to organize finance knowledge so it's digestible and understandable for people so they make better decisions. And then of course, you know, we're a for-profit just like here. If you get bored and you're like, this is a waste of our time, you know, we offer services that actually help implement some of these things. But in the end, we don't really care if you work for us or you do it yourself. Our mission, again, is to empower investor education and help the financial service sector essentially be better and serve clients better. And we think that's done via education and essentially radical transparency about just what works and what doesn't. Because it, it's got to change where it can't just be opaque and complex to just get extra fees where you win but none of the clients do. We think the financial industry needs to be simple and transparent and focused on educating people so they make better decisions. So thank you very much for your time. And I'll take any questions if there are any in the audience here. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I kind of miss the point of the exercise, like um, to determine whether or not you're a do-it-yourselfer. Yeah. Isn't like the biggest factor whether you're okay with like losing money for long periods of time? Not, not really. It, it's really about how how much you can control. Look yourself in the mirror and say, yes, I can control my own innate bias. If you can do that. Do it yourself is a great approach. Because what we see all the time is, and engineers are actually perfect DIY people, because they're kind of, in general, focused on process, robustness, and they just stick to systems. The issue is a lot of times people build a system. They're like, wow, this works. And usually it works because it's in a sustainable active situation where it works because it sometimes doesn't work. So, so we, all, we can do the back testing, do the research. We're like, oh, yeah, this is money good. And you're like, we're going to do it forever. And then, of course, it can't work all the time. So the minute the quarter comes out, the year comes out, and you're like, God, I should have just bought the Vanguard fund. I should have just done this or that. If you don't have that ability to stick to that program because you're letting your innate bias start to move you away from like doing the process that initially actually added value, it, that, that's why you, you sometimes need an outside you know, source to help you do that. And that's why there's a lot of interesting business models like Wealthfront right now, for example, right? Those are great solutions because they're systematic, process-driven, transparent, and cheap. But, and that's great for a huge segment of the population, awesome. The issue is, are you the person that can actually do that or do you actually need the psychology coach? And as far as I know right now, Humans are still the best psychology coach for other humans because we don't, when the machine says, oh, stick to the program, don't worry about it, like we're like, ah, this stupid computer, I'm going to throw it out, I'm just going to sell. And, and so, so that's a challenge for like automated players out there that are basically delivering great solutions, but that's not the, that's not the skill as being a good investor. We can all generate great processes and great systems. The skill is having the discipline to actually stick to the thing. And some people just need a human to kind of be like, yo, calm down, chill out, and stick with it. So, so that's why I'm highlighting here is like we all have this weird bias and wiring that can potentially run us astray. And a DIY is, is really good for people that can stick to the program. But if you feel like maybe you can't, that, that's where um, you, know, you might need some help. So, or, or you could just de you could just go put your money under a pillow too. Uh, that's, that's another way to DIY, but then you're losing out on you know, the opportunity to grow your wealth.
Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, I've, I've recently been thinking about uh, things like uh, wealth rent and uh, what's the uh, betterment. Yeah, betterment. There's uh, lots of them. Yeah. Uh, so they they basically do um, like they rebalance your portfolio kind of often. Like I heard every month or two or something. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering what the advantage of that versus just like every year, like you were saying, just get like. Um, those same stocks that, or those same index funds that they offer, yeah. and just like leave them for a year. Uh, what is the advantage of uh, doing that so frequently, given that uh, there might be taxes associated with the sale? Yeah. So, um, so the reason they do a lot of the trading is probably related to like tax loss harvesting, where, where the idea is if you have a loser and you can realize that and distribute that loss, it can save you on taxes. So it may be beneficial to let winners kind of ride and systematically harvest losses because you can use those losses to offset taxable gains in the future. There's a fee you got to pay for that, and there's frictional costs. And you pay 25 basis points for that. And it could be nice because you can distribute losses. You can also pay five basis points and go buy the Vanguard ETF, which has 100% tax deferral on it because it's within an ETF structure. You don't get short-term tax loss harvesting benefits, so you can't distribute losses, but it's deferred capital gain forever and only costs you five basis points. So I, I think it really, you got to figure out, okay, 25 bips plus the underlying fees of the thing, let's say it's 35, 40 bips, versus DIY, maybe I can do it myself for 10 to 15 basis points with ETFs, and if that 15, 20 bit differential there you know, if you just don't want to deal with it because it's a pain in your butt, fine. You know, but it, you, you can make an argument either way. It's really about what's the value of your time, and do you want to do this yourself, or do you want to do an automatic solution, and is that price differential make sense? Um, I think if you're wired to actually want to do this, and we always recommend people take control of their own capital because you care about your money more than anyone else does. You know, you can basically do what they do very cheaply, but a lot of the automated guys, they're just not that expensive. So it's more about a question of like, what's the value of your time? What you probably don't want to do is pay someone a huge fee to do that. Like maybe for 25 basis points, you can invest in low cost funds. But I don't want to maybe pay someone 100 basis points to do that. That, that differential is too high. And if you're really cheap, you, you don't even need to pay the 25 bips. You can just buy them direct and totally disintermediate everything. And yeah, people should do that if, if they want to. Why not? Can you explain uh, how, why value investing and momentum investing aren't in contradiction? Because with momentum investing, you, you would have picked those top stocks, but then got yeah. invested. And also with the value investing, how do you account for stock loss? Or, I mean, um, selection bias, where companies have disappeared from your data set, and, and how you compensate. Yeah, yeah, sure. So to the data question, it, uh, most researchers and academic research they use crisp data, which is, you know, they have whole teams that try their best to eliminate this problem, where they get backfilled, delisted data. They have someone go hunt down, like, was that because it was a merger and acquisition? Was that because they went bankrupt, what have you? So that, that is kind of the gold standard for doing research, because we got to account for this delisting bias, right? And, and I think that's pretty well flush out at this point that it, it's pretty good, doesn't have survivor bias in it. So the next question is, how can you simultaneously have value, which is essentially an overreaction to, um, and we, we spend like a whole book explaining this, so I'll try to do this as simple as, as, as possible here. Give me a sec. All right, so value is essentially seems to be driven by an overreaction to crappy news in the short run, right? That systematically mean reverts. And, and in theory, we make money on this because of mispricing, because that cheapness is essentially a proxy for market-wide expectation errors that we can use to use that proxy as a signal to kind of front run future market expectations, right? Where people are like, oh, wow, you know, IBM is not going bankrupt. It's obviously not going to become Google. But it's not as bad as expected, and you make money on that expectations change, right? Momentum, it turns out, and it's a lot more complex, I think, in the psychology. People or even the researcher are trying to figure out. 
the vast proportion of the empirical evidence, and I literally just got done doing this because I just wrote a book on it, is actually momentum, ironically, is actually the opposite. It's an underreaction to good news. So this price signal comes out, and you see this price signal keeps doing really well relative to other securities out there. And prices tell you a lot about information in the future. It's saying, hey, this thing is really good, and it keeps going up. But for some reason, markets, it, sh it should be worth here, and the thing is moving up. But it this doesn't immediately go to fundamental value. There's like this systematic underreaction to this good news that's coming out. And you can map that back to like unexpected earnings releases and everything. So they're actually, they're kind of the same idea. One is just an overreaction to crappy news. The other one is essentially an underreaction to positive news that's associated with prices only. The value anomaly right here, remember, this is a price relative to a fundamental. So that's why this is growth and this is value. Momentum has nothing to do with fundamentals, only price. And if you actually look at the overlaps on portfolios between growth securities and high momentum securities, the names, and it, they're act, it's actually really low. And you also can see it in the data. Growth portfolios underperform the market by a wide margin. Momentum portfolios kick the, the market's butt. It's volatile as heck, and it's crazy. But that growth and momentum, even though they sound the same, and most people even in industry don't understand this difference. They're totally different. Growth is about price to a fundamental, which is a, is a quotient. Momentum is all about price only. And you can sometimes have value stocks be momentum stocks, right? Similar, you can have expensive stocks be high momentum stocks. But momentum and, and value are, are kind of different ideas out there. But it, but it's very nuanced, um, and unless you you know geek out and you know do source journal literature, a lot of people are like oh momentum is just growth. It's just that's not true, especially when you define momentum as actually it's defined in the literature that captures the actual anomaly that everyone's talking about. Um, I don't I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I mean it sounds like you're using the price to like it's PB. For this. for this, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's surprising that 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 correlates so well with the past five years of yeah. earning potential. That seems highly unlikely that that just doing that ratio would give you such a nice graph. Yeah, of FICO to to relate to growth, which is based on just price. Right? Uh, well, price to earnings. Yeah. yeah. Th th so this is a, this is a, a price to fundamental ratio, and and like I said, that's one of the arguments of why this works is because price to fundamentals basically proxy for an expectation problem, right? On the growth side, you know, people think it's way better than it ends up always being on average. Yeah, and then value. But then again, momentum, and this is a very new, and if I had a whiteboard, I could actually like write this up here a little bit better. It's only about price. And there's a lot, there's a lot of really interesting theories because one of the things, and this is something even I don't fully understand, I don't think anyone does, I'm just trying my best to finally get it. In general, value is thinking about fundamentals and prices move around a fundamental, right? That's kind of the, the core theory of how this, this whole game works. But you know, George Soros and some of these guys, they have this idea of reflexivity. And, and I think you can see it in Palo Alto, where prices might actually reverse influence fundamentals, right? For example, LinkedIn. Just a while ago, before they blew up, you know, the price was, was way high. You could, you could have your options to your employees, and that's fundamentally good. Price goes down 50%. Let's just say that wasn't even fundamental related. How are you going to attract talent? How, you know, and you got all this bad PR out there, like, oh, LinkedIn's dying. And now just the price movement itself, even if it was non-fundamentally related, can actually fundamentally affect the firm. Right, so there, there's like there's one there's one cause going from fundamentals to price action, but I think more and more, and this is where it gets confusing. You can argue, I think, justifiably that prices themselves can influence fundamentals. Right, if you have a high flying stock and you can go sell stock equity for way overvalued, you can fundamentally create value for this firm. So so 
and it, this is what I, because I used to be like totally in the religion of value investing, and it's taken me a while to come around to this whole momentum thing. But, but now that I, I'm thinking, okay, it's not just fundamentals and then prices move around you. It's prices can actually influence the fundamentals. And if prices are moving up, and let's say fundamentally that's just the price signals making the fundamentals change, this can be a proxy for maybe nonlinear benefits that the market doesn't really appreciate yet. Because stock's moving up, oh wow, we could, our cost of capital is way lower than it used to be because everyone just loves our stock even if they overvalue it. That's great because I can do acquisitions cheaper than the other guy who has crappy price action because his cost of capital is higher. So that, that momentum could actually indirectly be affecting the fundamentals, but the market's not really appreciating that yet. And, and so I, I think momentum is way more complex. That's why I think it also works a lot better. It actually works way better in value because it's totally counterintuitive. Who wants to be the bag holder owning the 52-week high stock? Right? There's disposition effects. Most people... When, they, when it's moving up, they want to book the profit, right? So you have in, you know, like supply shocks coming on when, when things are moving up. Whereas when they're moving down, everyone's like, they want to just hold it. They're like, ah, oh, we don't want to realize that loss. That's too painful. So there's a lot of weird psychological things that, that, are, that are involved with momentum. And like I said, I don't think anyone understands it as explicitly as value, which is a little bit easier to understand. Momentum is just somewhat you know, interesting. Um, and it's certainly one part behavioral driven, certainly one part risk driven because it's way more volatile. Um, it's really interesting. And the value momentum combination is really interesting because they're unrelated to each other. So that's another anomaly in itself. Value is kind of anomalous, momentum is kind of anomalous. When you put them together because they're like yin and yang, you get all these weird portfolio benefits and no one can explain that. That's totally like a puzzle in, in, I think, research right now. Sir? Do you, um, with the sort of burgeoning momentum strategies in, you know, many sort of aspects or, or many yeah. sort of stocks, do you think that momentum will be arbitraged away? No, because I, I think momentum sits in that sustainable active framework. And, and this is really how all these things work. So momentum, it seems pretty clear that there's some behavioral mispricing component. It is so painful to do right. Like value is kind of painful. Momentum, you will die sometimes, right? And, and, and that's what you want. You want strategies where the where the bag, you gotta be the last bag holder that's willing to be like, no, I understand how and why this works, and I want to see it be horrific sometimes. Because now I know it's sustainable. Whereas if I have a strategy where like I do all this research and it just like makes money like a made off return stream. I don't want to do that because there's tons of physics PhDs that are going to figure that out and arbitrage that away. So we want systems that are mechanically exploiting some behavioral issue, but also really painful for basically delegated asset managers to really follow in their purest form because they'll lose their job. But that's good because you don't have all the capital com competing it away. So and, and momentum is totally hair raising. Like, like if you're a concentrated momentum, player that's trying to exploit this anomaly, you are going to get fired a lot. Same thing with value. If you're a, like if you're a Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett's unique because he has kind of captured capital. But if you do strategies like him, people every few years are going to think, ah, oh, Warren Buffett's such an idiot. What a, what a dolt, you know? Like he's underperforming for five years or whatever it is. That's actually the greatest signal ever. When you see redemptions coming out on strategies that you know work because they exploit the systematic bias problem, because that's why they work, is because the, the, the people that used to believe in them and went on the active side give up, and then they contribute to the very anomaly they're trying to exploit because they're selling out at the worst possible time, and you've got to be that weird person that's the bag holder. And that's why active investing is insanely hard. Because you got to be a weird person. And that's why most people should go buy Vanguard funds. And most active products you buy are not going to be the active products that work because they're basically closet index funds that essentially just do what the Vanguard funds do but more expensive. You want active things to be insane, where you just feel painful sometimes to be in this thing. Because then you know they're going to work because they're sustainable. Um, and so it's like a weird you know, dynamic game that you have to think through. So, uh, 
So it's not easy. Sir? Do you think that it's possible the value in Romney now is gone because, you know, it's underperformed in, for a long time now? Yeah. Um, and he, even the Dean Chandler himself said that, it, you know, the pace of communications is a lot greater now. There's the internet. When all sure. the things were done, there was no internet for most of the time period. Yeah. Do you think that fundamentally things might have actually changed now? I, well, I think the actual evidence right now is the exact reason. It's like the, the exception that proves the rule. Value's underperformed. And so if all of a sudden I saw massive capital inflows to value funds right now, I would be afraid it was getting arbitraged away. You see the exact opposite. Value's dead. What a dumb strategy. You see redemptions coming out, which is exactly in line with why the thing works. And to the information thing, I actually think all the information, the ability to like go on Robin Hood and buy a stock like on your phone, watching CNBC, tons of info, it's all it's doing is giving people availability bias. Because true active opportunities, they're basically long duration arbitrages that have a lot of noise in the short run. And if you match short duration capital with a long duration opportunity, they end up contributing to the anomaly. And the more information is available, the more people can buy and sell at their whims and their emotions. It's, in, my, in my thoughts, it's actually making these things worse. Like the more you have availability and access to edge that will give you overconfidence in whatever idea or story you're believing in, I think it's going to make these things even better, frankly. Because now anyone can go buy a stock they like in an instant. They can go do their own back test. And if people just go back test willy nilly without understanding robustness, frameworks, like competitive dynamics of marketplaces. They're going to just back test, oh wow, this is like easy money, start doing that. It's just contributing more and more to the problems. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I think that they're actually more sustainable now. I, th I think information just forces people to make worse decisions because it's more available, it's more in their face. They got you know, more saliency, and, and they just make worse decisions. Um, and, and, and empirically, we could investigate how and why these anomalies would get arbitraged away, because at the exact worst time when they stop working, if you saw tons of capital coming in, I would be really worried, because that means the you know, people are, are being smart, but you see the exact opposite. Fun flows away from the short-term losers all the time, and that just contributes to this thing. Uh, and that also contributes to why the best poker players don't want to do it, because they're losing assets and losing their jobs. Sir? Yeah, I got a question about active investing. Sure. Uh, I got a question about active investing in terms of how to read momentum. I mean, yeah. for value, it seems like you could fairly straightforward value to you know, price to fundamentals. Yeah. You can determine what's cheap and expensive. But yeah. I mean, momentum, like do you read technical indicators to get a sense of what is that, or, or are you looking at momentum against the actual fundamentals? Um, you said it's just based on price, so I assume mostly technical. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, it's just pure price based. So the classic academic anomaly that's momentum is essentially what you do is every month you'll say you have a thousand securities, you just sort them on their past twelve month return, just to keep this real easy. And it turns out that those that are in the top, say hundred, tend to outperform the next month, right? And those in the bottom one hundred that were relatively weak tend to continue to, to underperform, right? And you, you, you keep doing this every month, you get this huge momentum spread. Very simple, just 12-month look back, sort, you get the spread. That's the most generic version, and it's that itself is really effective, but it's also painful as heck. Now, we and I have a whole book about this, but if you believe in the behavioral theory and you think it's an underreaction to you know, fundamental news or fundamental information that's getting pounded on those prices, and it's just an empirical fact. There's, you can Google, it's called frog in the pan is this, is this name of the algorithm. The idea is that you know, if, if a frog's in the hot boiling water, they immediately know and they jump out, right? Whereas you can also put a frog in water and slowly heat it up, and then they get killed in the end, right? Because they have limited attention to what's going on. They don't feel it. So same thing with momentum. If you tweak the algorithm where instead of just generically buying all the, the best relative performers, those top 100, what happens if you have a biotech in there? It's up 100% because yesterday got FDA approval. That's like the frog feels the heat and it jumps out. Everyone knows about it. It's on CNBC. It's, it's all great. But what about these, these momentum stocks? They're in the high momentum bucket, 
but they're just slowly grinding there. It's like more of a stable momentum. It's just like you see this price movement, like 50 bips over two, 300 days versus like the ones that just go up in a day. Well, it turns out that the momentum anomaly is almost exclusively driven by those securities that are in that high momentum bucket that have that slow grinding momentum. Because if you get like the biotech that shoots up 100%, those are efficient market price. They're just high risk, high reward deals. Uh, and that goes back to the behavioral bias. It's an underreaction to news where when you see the FDA approval, it goes up 100%. Everyone sees that. Everyone reacts to it. Whereas the small grinding kind of information is being released over time, that's more likely to be underreacted to. And that's exactly what you see in the data. Uh, it's still painful. Um, but that, that's all you do. You don't need to make it that complex. And there's some, there's some seasonality things and what have you. But if you just email me when this book comes out, it's Cindy Quant Mon. There's a whole book dedicated to it. But the summary is this slow moving momentum is better than wacky momentum. Question? Question? Mm -hmm. And suppose for our 401k type thing, it is 30 years yeah. mean type of investment. Would you go to 100% stock rather than 60 40? Yeah. So this is just a generic endowment portfolio. But really what you're going, you're going to always get the most tax efficient, highest risk premium associated with equity. And you can really juice that with value and momentum, especially working as a system. This bucket over here is the diversifier bucket. So if you really have 30-year horizon and you can really stick to that, then no, it doesn't make sense to have diversifiers because you only have diversifiers because you may have a liquidity need, right? And, and the reason that matters, if you have a lot of volatility, but you might need to have take liquidity, well, if the thing blew up and I need to take liquidity, I'm screwed because I'm doing it at the bottom. But if you generally don't need to touch this thing for a long time and you have the discipline to deal with the fact that it's going to go all over the place, you should have less diversifiers and exploit your long duration capability. But you got to be, you know, make sure you're mentally wired to know what you're about to get into. But yeah, I think you, know, you wouldn't want to do this as like a young person that doesn't need that capital for 30 or 40 years, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some of us do value investing by yeah. buying Berkshire Hathaway shares. By buying what? Berkshire Hathaway shares. What is it? Berkshire. Oh, Berkshire. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Um, and then they see the news that uh, Warren Buffett himself says that, okay, for my inheritors, I leave some and I will leave it in index fund S&P 500. Yeah. Then they question whether they are doing the correct or they should be buying S&P 500. So out of these two models, which one do you think more well, better passive value investment? It all comes down to this. Because this is what you got. If you're going to be active, if you're not wired to deal with pain, you're going to be the worst active investor ever. So vast majority of people should just not get, you know, pay all these extra fees for all these crazy marketed products. It's all crap. You can buy it way cheaper and more effectively at Vanguard, right? And you don't have a psychology problem because the market's down 30, you're down 30, and you're just like, well, whatever, I'm relatively good to go. The minute you go on the active angle, you take on a whole new level of psychology problems. And that's why it works. Because now you're in this competitive game where you got to be that weird, wired person that does crazy stuff and be willing to be the bag holder at maximum pain. Because then you'll capture all the rents of this active strategy where all the people that don't have that discipline can't. And it's all about that relativeness, which seems to drive this risk premium. So Warren Buffett says this because he understands this. And he knows that unless you're wired to deal with years of just looking like an idiot, you're way better off being a passive person. Because otherwise, you're going to sell at the worst possible time. So that, that's why he makes that recommendation. That's why I make that recommendation. This is not for everyone. It's the worst. It gives you like balding and gray hair like I got. Right, <laughs> like, like if you want to be chilling out on the beach and not worry about life, just go buy your van car funds and chill out, and you'll keep your hair, your nice, you'll stay brown, you don't have to worry about it. Active investing is going to make you go insane, and that's probably why you get a risk premium because it sucks. 
You know, it's like terrible. Um, but that's, that's life. Markets are not efficient in the sense that prices always reflect fundamentals, but they're insanely competitive. So it's not like money grows on trees. There's always a premium and a cost. It's just a matter of like, am I suited to take this cost better than the person offering that risk premium to me? And you know, value people earn that because they're usually weird. You know, they can feel like an idiot at the cocktail party and be like, I don't care. Um, you know, a lot of people can't do that. So, or we'll go, we'll go over here, sir. So I have a couple questions. Number yeah. one is, are there any funds out there that are capturing that momentum premium you were talking about? Um, there are. Um, I don't want to talk my book here, uh, but the, we, you know, here's the thing. Another thing to understand about active management is there's the business of active management, right? And if I'm a large institutional firm, and really I get paid on just assets, when I'm designing a product, most products that work are going to have some scalability issue. Momentum is a perfect example where momentum, to get it to be effective, it has to have relatively high turnover. Right? That's just how that system works. But the problem with relatively high turnover is that's relatively high frictional costs. So if I try to jam a billion dollars into this thing, I can design the, the, the program one way. If I need to jam $20 billion in this program, I need to maybe diversify and dilute this thing out so it can take on capacity, which is now a business decision, not necessarily like an optimized you know, capture the premium over time decision. And so just when you buy products, think through the economics of the manufacturer of that product. Are they building this for performance? Or are they building this for scalability and to try to jam as many assets into it as possible? And because markets at the margin are insanely efficient, the many, you, as like Buffett says, like if you gave us $20, 30000000000 billion, you'd want to fire us, right? Because we can't do active, weird things anymore because you got to jam too much money through the same door. And, and so it's, yeah, it, it, that's the problem. Um, when you're looking at products, like understand the situation of that, you know, manufacturer of this product. And are they trying to build something that works in expectation? Or are they trying to form a portfolio where they just go have a bunch of salesmen jam it down your throat, but it can take on like $20 billion, right? Because that, and, and maybe you as the buyer of that product, everything's called momentum, everything's called value, but the construction of these things matters a lot. Because the name doesn't mean anything. It's, it's really about what's the engineering of, of the product. Um, yeah, so, so there's definitely momentum things out there, and we do that, but I don't want to, I mean, you go, we're all about education, you go learn on your own, we can talk offline. Um, but there, there are some people, Alpha Architect, that, that is trying to build, like, generally intellectual honest products that have limited scalability, and, and, we're, and we're trying to do them, like, the intellectually honest way. Um, and we just tell people, like, this is going to suck sometimes, but if you have horizon duration, this is at least the honest way to go about this. But it, it, unless you're wired to do that, you shouldn't do that. Um, but not many people do that because they'd rather just raise like 100 billion assets and charge a lot of money for it. So. All right. So the next question is related to that, which yeah. is that some strategies just suck. Yeah. Other strategies are good, but yeah. they are going to suck at times. How do yeah. you differentiate? Um, well, l let, me, let me step back here, actually. There are, there's two worlds out there, right? There's the investment horizon game, which is what I'm talking about here. There actually is another game out there of the best poker player game. This is a real game. It's like proprietary trading, hedge funds, where there are strategies you can devise with a ton of work where you get some competitive information edge where in the short term, it's actually like a true edge, right? They always have capacity constraints, and they may not even be that painful, but the issue there is that's the trading business. You're always having to adapt because you're competing against all the Google people, right? And all the physics PhDs where you find a system, it works for a while, all of a sudden you're like, oh, you know, it's actually not even painful because you can lever it out, make a lot of money, but it starts to decay, and you've got to always be on the R&D game of inventing the next best trading strategy. Those aren't sustainable opportunities. They're not painful, and they work, but that's a different business. That's a trading business. Back to here, the, basically the way to look at it, the more pain 
And the more delegated asset managers would not want to do this, in expectation that's probably going to work better at the margin. So if whatever strategy you do, if it's less painful on a relative tracking, like it tracks the index with less pain, it's going to generally work less well. It's just a general rule because of competition. If it's less painful and there's less likelihood of getting fired, it's probably not going to have as much kind of career risk premium built into it. Where if it's more painful and it's more likely delegated asset managers will get fired, you're going to eat a bigger, you're going to capture a bigger career risk premium. And, and so it's not that one's good or bad. It's really about pick your poison, essentially, um, is, is what, what I would say. Um, so it just depends how, how much bang you want for your buck and how much, if you're better suited to take career risk pain than maybe other people are. And DIY people are very well suited to take career risk pain because you can't fire yourself, right? So, so that's why inter, or disintermediation is a beautiful thing because you know, if you're a Google engineer and you sit here and like learn about all this stuff and you have the real horizon and you understand how and why it works, you're in the perfect position to, to take on career risk because it's not priced for you. Right, it's priced for delegated asset managers, not as an individual. You can just eat it because what are you going to do? Fire yourself? You know, <laughs> so you, you can capture that premium better than anyone, but the problem is you've got to invest a lot of time and knowledge and education and, and figuring out how it works. So, sir. Regarding the asset management side, you know, I think it's interesting that you can really Yeah, there is a huge wide wide range, but again, it goes back to I believe there is a there's supposed to be in theory like risk premiums associated with taking on risk, right? Equity risk premium. You don't know what's going to happen. I think embedded in a lot of strategies and algorithms is career risk premium because the people that manage the billions and hundreds of billions of dollars, they are, they they need to maintain that business, and they know that if you deviate a small amount from an index, you're not going to get fired. So you can earn a little marginal spread over the Vanguard guys because you can charge higher for effect effectively what they're doing, and that's a great business decision. Take minimal career risk, make it a little bit different, but never too much different because you could lose your AOM and lose your whole business model. Whereas, in, but as you get strategies that get further and further away, where they can go 10% under the index, 10% over, and go crazy, there's there's going to be a premium there because the marginal price setter is these institutions that are the smart poker players, and they all know this too. They just won't do it because it's too risky, and they, their client base is not hyper-educated, and they're not Warren Buffetts. They're like mom and pops who look at their statement and are like, what, three years down? Like, this guy's out of here. I sell it. And so that, there's a premium, I think, that's priced in systems and strategies that, that basically eat career risk because the marginal price setters are the smart poker players in the world, and they don't want to eat that risk because that's painful and they like to keep their business, right? And, and that's, that's just, I think, the equilibrium that, that actually has happened. So if there is a model, like, because you're an individual, perhaps you don't lose a job over a business acceleration, can you take a greater risk in an institutional investment? You can take greater career risk. Because remember, there's, there's real risk, which in theory in, like, you know, economics is, is how, like, the risk is correlated with, like, your consumption over time or whatever, you know, wacky macroeconomic model. But you're in a position to take the career risk, which is relative risk. So I always tell people, imagine you're an alien, and you, you land on the world in 1927, and you t the alien's like, all right, I got two options. I can buy this S&P thing that makes 9% a year with an 80% drawdown or whatever it is, right? You can buy this other thing called value, and it makes, let's say, 12% a year and 80% drawdowns. The alien who doesn't care about what S&P is because he's not benchmarking or whatever, he's like, well, yeah, do this other one, of course. But if the alien is now a delegated agent working on behalf of others and he's benchmarked against that S&P product and he has now a business reason <laughs> to like kind of not deviate too much from that, in theory, he would be all in on this value strategy 
But because there's this pricing on he's always benchmarked against S&P, you know, he, he's going to price that at some level because that's painful if he deviates too far away. So it's all about the relativeness that build the relative, um, you know, tracking error and this career risk associated with being a delegated asset manager. That gets priced because the marginal price setter embeds a career risk premium that shouldn't be priced in theory in like an economic model, but it is priced because there's so much delegated asset management. And, and you don't want to be the, the weirdo that gets fired. And an individual doesn't care about that risk premium because who cares? Like, I, I, don't ha I don't care about relativeness, or you shouldn't. You should just care about absolute after tax, after fee, risk adjusted returns. Um, so you, you're just in a position to, to be able to exploit that, basically. Yeah. So on the 60-40 question that was yeah. asked earlier, every once in a while, although rarely, but every once in a while, I see an article or a graph that attempts to prove that some kind of rebalancing, like yearly or quarterly or whatever, actually ends up better in the 60-40 model than in just 100% equity. Is that unlucky, you know, lucky for them, unlucky yeah. for us as data points, or is there anything sustainable for that? Um, I think there, again, this is where the danger zone is of DIY. The answer is yes, there could be. The problem is the minute you start adding complexity, assuming you're not going to do it yourself, there's this huge risk that you start adding one layer of complexity that maybe adds value, but then People need to spin that and make that insanely complex, and you pay a lot of money in it, eat a lot of taxes, and on net, it wasn't a good idea. So can you add things like this, like smarter rebalances or more complex programs where you could find a robust, genuine effect that works better? Yes. The problem is, how do you identify what is the signal and what was the noise especially after all the fees and additional things that usually will come with a whiz-bang mousetrap. So yeah, maybe it adds 50 basis points a year, let's say. For let's say you have a cooler rebalance program that's more systematic and exploits some sort of anomaly or whatever, and it works. The problem is it may have a real genuine edge, but after the taxes, the frictional, and the cost of accessing it, because you have to pay the whiz-bang you know, smart PhD person, on net, you would have probably been better off just doing you know, some plain vanilla thing. So it, it's more like an optimization accounting for fees, brain damage, taxes. Whereas if you operate in a vacuum, sure, there's a lot of great things you can do that have insane complexity, but, uh, but then you get into that risk curve of because of the salesman, the expert, they're good at exploiting your bias, they're good at exploiting your telling you great stories. It's really hard to start to differentiate, like, is this complexity actually doing something for me? Or is this just a great sales pitch? And, and now you, most of the time, you end up paying a lot for the sales pitch, but the complexity didn't actually add any value for you. Um, but yeah, certainly there's ways to do better than everything I've told you here. But the intent here is to help a DIY person facilitate a good after-tax, after-fee outcome if they wanted to go down that path. Sir. To, to follow up on that, and to clarify, yeah. so if, if you have a, a diversification, if, if it's more like you're diversifier, then you're kind of main, yeah. which is probably the other portion of it, the yeah. portion, um, you can, as you rebalance, can you like half harvesting and yeah. sort of set it to the right? But if you're all 100% in equities, like the young person doesn't really care about the first layer, you yeah. lose that advantage. So just what's the trade off there between? Well, you, you could still be 100% equity and still do tax loss harvesting, right? Well, well, why, why couldn't you do that? Because you could always, like, if you, let's say you own S&P and it, you know, bombs out, you know, sell it and buy, like, something 99% correlated, you still own S&P, but you still booked your, your tax loss harvesting there. Yeah, but, but I mean, it's, you, you can just, you know, it's pretty obvious. Like, Russell 1000, SP 500, SP 450. And just go on Yahoo Finance or Google Finance, and you know they have the same chart path. <laughs> so you know you could obviously use Bloomberg, or we do it like formally. But you know, as a DIY person, you know what's correlated because you just map the the charts over, and when they look exactly the same, you know that's probably a good you know tax loss harvesting candidate. Um, so, but yeah, you you could do that with an all equity. It's just 
in, in general, think about it. If I'm 60-40 in a vacuum, and maybe I annual rebalance to keep like the things in line. Bonds, like a 10-year bond, the yield is whatever, 2%. That's what it's going to earn if held to maturity, effectively 2%. Whereas equities usually have a component of what you can get for free, which is a 10-year bond, plus an equity risk premium, which is usually, say, 3 to 4% over time, right? So just mechanically, equities, if you're a long-term holder, you're going to get paid that risk premium, where if you add the diversifiers, which have low expectations, they're great because they help you diversify, and that's why you're taking a lower expectation. But if you just want to rip it and get the highest CAGR possible, and you don't care about risk because you've literally got 30-year horizon, there, you know, the argument is, is why would you have more diversifiers, which lower your expectation, if you don't need to pay up because you want the risk because you want to just bang it out of the park. Um, so, so you may want to tilt out on the risk curve. Uh, but you know, it just depends, though. If you can't handle that, then you might need diversifiers just to make sure you stay with some equity, right? Because some people go in equity, blows up, they sell all of it, and of course it bounces back. Um, so, it's, so it's all about the psychology of investing and doing things that help you stick to a process. So it, it says right there, you know, active is simple but can't be easy, and I think you mentioned that that is. Mm -hmm. Relative pain. Relative pain. Yeah. If you look at the equity curves of like the RAA system and MEBS QAA system yeah. and dual equity and stuff or dual momentum, I mean they're like beautiful equity curves that you know low drawdown. So sure. how, how do those kind of? Yeah. So so when you start getting in like the trend following world, well I didn't talk about that here because it's a whole nother like we could talk for a whole day on that. Trend following. This is another thing where you know come out of Chicago. I was like. What are you guys talking about? Technical, this is the dumbest idea ever. But at some point, you got to break from religion and start getting back to evidence-based you know, decision making. And long-term trend following is very clear over long horizons. And we could give you a whole lecture about the behavior of it, why it works. Because I agree, those charts look kind of smooth. But that's because you're seeing the chart over a long horizon. When you start zooming in, there's a lot of whipsaws. So there's a lot of opportunities where the trend rule says, hey, go to cash, and the market goes ripping higher, and you're like, God, I'm an idiot, and you want to give up on it. And also, trend following rules are great because they do protect that drawdown. But again, going back to the relative risk premium that I think is price and securities, in an absolute sense, if you could say, hey, I'm going to deliver your S&P with half the drawdown, people would be like, well, yeah, why wouldn't you do that? But then you go to the real marketplace, and sometimes, even though you're delivering that S&P with half the drawdown, you may be in cash when the S&P goes up 30%. And you're going to feel like a big idiot and think, this trend falling stuff doesn't work. Why would I ever do this? And a lot of delegated asset managers are thinking that too. Because it, it's, it's all about staying power to a process and a system that where you do your research, you try to understand what, like, why does trend falling work? And, and I can tell you, it's basically, I think it's dynamic risk aversion. And there's, we can do a whole lecture on that. So there's reasons why I think long-term trend works. And there's definitely reasons why other people don't do it. Imagine a mutual fund manager or a delicate asset manager, even yourself, where you sit in cash sometimes. What, meanwhile, the market goes on a ripping run. You're going to lose your entire business. So that doesn't make sense. It's much better just do go with the crowd and follow the lemmings because when you're down 30, yeah, maybe you're down 30, 29, you're not going to get fired. Whereas if you're just flat and the market's on a 30% rager and they're like, you idiot, you're in cash and bonds, like you're gone, you're out of here. And then, you know, and then of course, in, in people have short memories. So trend falling is real hot in 08 and those guys raised a ton of money because it saved them from the drawdown. But now they've all underperformed because we haven't had a big face ripping drawdown yet. But guess what? Everyone hates trend falling right now. They're like, ah, oh, this is stupid. It whipsaws all the time. Doesn't work. Bunch of idiots data mining. What will happen when we have another 50% drawdown and the thing protects you from half of it? Everyone's going to love trend falling. They're going to cycle. It's just the cycle of life. It's just investing. It's how it works. So. Um, yeah, and, and, and it's all about like the back test. The same thing, value momentum. If you look at the chart, you're like, who wouldn't do that? 
But you start zooming in, you look at these relative periods where in real time you underperform by two or three years. Like, who can stick to that? And, and, and that all these programs are like that.